My name is James Corey. I'm a programme director at Wilton Park. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce, first of all, James Cameron, who is the chair of the Overseas Development Institute here in London, uh, for the opening remarks in what I'm sure will make a fascinating and certainly a timely afternoon of discussion. So please, James. Well, it's my task to welcome you all to ODI. It's a fantastic gathering in the room, but it's also online. So welcome all those who are somewhere else in the world but connected to us here in London right now. Uh, this is a, an event to show off some really good work, uh, work done here at ODI, but work done collaboratively with other institutions that are going to be represented during the course of the day, Wilton Park, SEI and IDRI. It's a good indicator of what needs to be done to deal with the problem that it addresses. And it's probably worth just highlighting three points that perhaps will appear in conversation, uh, debate uh, around the course of the event. The first is that this is a significant year for international negotiations and for the UK. Uh, as the next president of the COP process, which makes us think hard about how to do negotiations, what the outcomes ought to be, what the focus ought to be, and how to deal with these big themes of mitigation and adaptation in a way which is effective. And that requires us to think hard about the nature of the problem, of course, which is a systems problem, a planetary system which is perturbed, agitated, needs to be responded to, but at a scale that's adequately measures up to the scale of the risk. And so if you're looking at a system that isn't at risk, you need to respond in a systemic way. But you also need to draw upon all the strengths and characteristics that we have as a species that is threatened by this risk of our own making. And that's where I draw some hope and strength from the idea that human society is hardwired, genetically programmed to cooperate just as much as it is to compete or to seek domination. And the elements of that cooperation are always in a social context. There are basic elements of cooperation that are manifested in the way we organize societies. And in this instance, the international society, the society of all societies, in its uh, attempt to respond to climate change through collaboration, through international negotiation, through a much higher level of interaction and integration than perhaps we've ever experienced before uh, uh, as, as a species. And so in order to give effect to that, we need better institutions. And those institutions need to be open the need to bring in the best ideas, circulate the best technologies, find ways of creating opportunity out of the risk that we face. And so this work helps emphasize the value of the trading system to the environment system. It shines light on the need for significant investment in the infrastructure required to be both capable of responding to climate change, reducing risk, but also adapting to it, building more resilient infrastructure in the face of the risk. And just to circle this back to the negotiations, that means that very simple, maybe even traditional forms of zero-sum, I win, you lose negotiations, strategies of that kind, will never be effective, will never be enough to cope with this particular problem. And so we've got to think better about how to do these negotiations so that the outcome is sufficient to deal with the scale of the risk that we face. So that's enough for me by way of introduction, but let me suggest that when you get to grips with the content of this work, you think yourselves about how your particular contribution could be joined with others to build a much more dense and rich and supportive infrastructure of collaboration. 
and that we open our minds to the possibility that solutions might come from unlikely places. Uh, that there might be winners that you don't know about today. There might be solutions that come from a different tribe, from a different constituency, from people who you don't normally see as your allies. And having an open system for the transference of ideas is equally valuable for the transference of resources at the scale required to deal with this problem. So once again, welcome, good luck, and have a good conversation during the course of the day, and I'll join in from time to time. Thank you, James. Many thanks, James, and thanks for setting uh, the bar high in terms of the level of ambition for this initiative. Um, before I introduce the panellists, I'll just briefly say a few words about why I'm here. Uh, Wilton Park is part of the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Why are we involved in this? Well, it, it's perhaps a, a cliché at this point to say that climate change is the multilateral diplomatic issue par excellence, but when that's said, it's almost always said in reference to mitigation. Uh, and what this uh, groundbreaking group of researchers here at the ODI in London, at the Stockholm Environment Institute, um, and at IDRI, the Institute for uh, Sustainable Development and International Relations in Paris, what that group of researchers is showing is that that aphorism is no less true uh, in relation to adaptation than it is to, to mitigation. That just as we, we can only effectively respond to the challenge of reducing carbon emissions um, by working together, so we must also adapt together uh, if we're to have any chance of protecting the most vulnerable people from the impact of climate change. Um, so that's why Wilton Park is involved. We were very pleased to work with all of these partners to host earlier this year a deep dive residential dialogue uh, on these themes. Uh, and I'm pleased now to introduce some of those who were involved in that dialogue uh, on our panel. So first of all, on my right, we have Rebecca Nadin, who is the Head of Risk and Resilience uh, at ODI. So in that role, she's responsible not only for this initiative, but, but for, for ODI's whole host of programs and, and initiatives in relation to risk and resilience. Um, the, uh, I know preceding your, your time at ODI, Rebecca, you, you have lots of experience working very directly with governments. You spent six years as a close advisor to the government of, of China, uh, the, the, the um, National Development and Reform Commission, um, and, uh, and before that with the British Council. Um, to my left, uh, Emma Howard Boyd. Uh, is uh, the chair of the Environment Agency, which is the UK's autonomous government body um, for, for environmental protection. Uh, she is also the UK's representative on the Global Commission for Adaptation, uh, which just left yesterday launched its flagship report, Adaptation Now, or Adapt Now. Uh, I'm sure you'll tell us some more about yeah, that, yeah. Emma. Um, and you also have lots of experience outside this sometimes closed world of, of government and multilateral institutions and you're very well placed to bring in a private sector perspective and, and, and a perspective from the financial sector so that's very much welcome as well and joining us uh, remotely is Ayman Sharkawi uh, from Casablanca uh, he is the coordinator of the Mohammed VI Prize for Climate and Sustainable Development um, he has many other hats as well. Uh, he, he's responsible for strategy at the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection. Uh, he's had many roles uh, at the UNFCCC uh, and as former di director of the uh, UN Global Compact in Morocco. So very happy to have you as well, Ayman. Likewise. Um, so I'll just say something about the structure uh, of the next hour and a half or so. So we'll start off with a series of, of brief presentations from each of our three panellists. We'll then move into some moderated discussion, and then we'll throw it open uh, to the floor, both here in the room in London and to uh, the several hundred people who I believe are, are now logged on and, uh, and watching us online. Um, I'd encourage both those in the room and those who are watching on the live stream uh, to live tweet. We have two hashtags uh, for the event and for the initiative, which are uh, adaptation without borders 
and adapt our world. So if you're, if you're tweeting during the event, please use uh, either of those hashtags or both. Um, and my pleasure now to turn to Rebecca Nadin to introduce the theme a little, to tell us what transboundary climate risks are, why they matter, uh, present a, a case study or two. I think uh, uh, that's a tall order for you, Rebecca, in just a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, James, um, and welcome everybody um, to ODI here today. Um, adaptation without borders. It's not just the name of the event today or the name of the initiative, but actually it's about a paradigm shift. That's, that's what needs to, to happen. As James um, Cameron said, we live in an interconnected um, and interdependent world. Our human and our natural systems are just that, they're systems. And climate change presents a systems risk, yet our approaches are often very siloed. It's heartbreaking at the moment when we think about the recent events in Mozambique um, and in the Bahamas. But whilst the politicians are arguing and, and negotiating about limiting um, our world to 1.5 degree global um, rise in mean temperature, actually, we're already probably looking at, at two degrees, um, if, if not more. So we must adapt. We can't just say, right, we're going to mitigate, we're mit going to mitigate. We actually, we, we, we have to adapt. Um, that's the situation that we're in. But our current framing um, is that countries only need to be sort of cognizant of the impacts um, and the adaptation to impacts within their own borders. But actually, climate change just doesn't work like that. As I said, it's, it's a systems risk. And actually, we need to better account for transboundary climate risks. Um, as climate change itself is borderless, it's not respecting biophysical, political, geographic borders. Um, so actually, we must think about how we adapt um, in that way too. So what do we actually mean by transboundary climate risk? I think it's important to sort of frame um, the afternoon um, so, so we understand what we're talking about. Here we're talking about risks, um, the impacts of climate change that cross national borders. So this can be in a range of um, pathways. It can be trade. We can talk about supply chain. It can be the biophysical around shared water resources. It can be through people um, in terms of, of migration and displacement or finance in terms of flows of capital. But also what we don't often talk about is some of those risks that are also created by our own um, adaptation responses and the impacts that those adaptation responses might have um, to neighboring um, countries. So let's take um, one brief um, example here. This is the 2011, 2011 Bangkok floods. So here you see one of the um, large Japanese factories completely um, submerged here. This caused about 46.5 billion um, in economic loss. Um, a lot of the um, insurance losses were actually borne by um, Thai insurance companies. And this created huge shock waves um, in terms of the shocks to Japanese um, supply chains leading to impacts in production in Malaysia, Vietnam and Indonesia. But it also meant that the Thai um, government um, put on um, an export ban on rice. So their exports of rice um, were curtailed. This then has an impact on other countries such as Senegal, for example. Senegal increasingly um, dependent on rice, now about 30% of the daily cal calorific intake um, is, is from rice. And this change has been driven by both industrialization and cheap imports. So they're highly exposed countries like Senegal to price fluctuations. In this particular case, um, India stepped in to increase their shipments to the African countries. But it's not beyond the realms of possibility that simultaneous climate events could happen in India, in Thailand, in, in other countries. That, so we'd have, they need to really be thinking about what that means um, across those borders. It's not just us that are raising um, the issue of transboundary um, climate risk either. Um, about 34 um, LDCs have already registered um, and named and explicitly made reference to issues of transboundary risk in their NAPAs. This is just a selection um, of some of those to, to give you some examples here today. The references are to migration, to water resource management, to food security, 
So this is an issue that is coming from countries themselves. This is an issue that countries themselves want um, other want to to help to be helped to address, um, and are raising this as an as an important area of concern. So why do they matter? They matter because, as we've just seen, they are affecting lots of different countries. In fact, actually, transboundary climate risks um, affect all countries due to, our, due to the interdependence, due to the interconnectedness of the world that we, we live in. Critically, they, they're important because it's about ch ch changing the lens through which we understand vulnerability as well. So some of the most exposed countries aren't always the ones that we think about Yes, of course, um, as we've seen, some small um, trade-dependent countries um, will be disproportionately impacted. But it's also Gulf Emirates, Southeast Asian manufacturing powerhouses, EU member states. So again, it's this reframing of this thinking in terms of what the adaptation challenge actually is. Um, <clears throat> and actually, no one country um, is Im immune to those effects which means that no one country um, can address those alone. So this is really also about a call to sort of a much more multilateral approach to addressing um, adaptation. So what's next? Well, in terms of what's needed, we need to be initiating and convening conversations on what transboundary climate risk means beyond the traditional adaptation community. So that's about bringing in finance community um, trade, private sector, and so on. But we also need to help develop a more robust evidence base to better understand the complexity and exposure and magnitude of these risks, to generate new data, and most importantly, guidance for decision makers on how to manage um, these risks. And also build connections, not just within UNFCCC to address these, but also across the other conventions, such as UNCCD, CBD, Water Convention and so on, and also sector-specific institutions have a critical role to play, such as WTO, FAO, etc. And most critically as well, about inspiring the next generation of climate action in terms of national adaptation planning. How are national adaptation plans that are being formulated at the moment taking into account um, global um, interdependencies? In order to drive this um, thinking forward, um, we formulated um, a new initiative. Um, and as James introduced, this at the moment is in partnership with SEI, IDRI, um, and ODI. We've also um, been recently joined, um, as of yesterday, um, by ISIMOD, um, the International Centre for Integrated Mountain and Development. So we're very pleased to have a very strong um, southern partner now part of this initiative as well. So what does the initiative um, intend um, and, and inspire to do? Well, most importantly, it intends to create visibility, to raise awareness, um, to change narratives um, about the urgency um, and need to, to think differently about adaptation, to gather that evidence that's so important for decision making, pool knowledge, to build connections, build connections between the different silos that exist, between the different UN conventions. There's a huge amount of learning and expertise, but at the moment it's still very um, siloed. And then most cri critically, to inspire action, to influence policy and to harness opportunities. And this initiative, this network, it's not just a research network, but it really is about advocacy um, and action. So we're looking for, for partners that can help us convene, can help fund activity, drive policy and change. And most importantly, to raise the ambition on adaptation, both in terms of understanding the risks, but also the opportunities. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, I'm going to turn to Emma Howard Boyd next. I think uh, in your... Uh, in your domestic role as chair of the Environment Agency, would be uh, very interested to hear your reflections on uh, on the implications of all of this for for policy in the UK. But then, beyond that, um, in your role as as the UK's commissioner uh, on on the Global Commission on Adaptation, 
uh, uh, perhaps you could uh, offer us some remarks on, on the uh, broader implications uh, at the international scale. Please, Very happy to. Shall I go there? I Please do. Yeah. So again, great to be here this afternoon, particularly on following up on 24 hours of, I think, really brilliant news on the climate change and adaptation agenda in particular. So yesterday with the launch of the report Adapt Now from the Global Commission on Adaptation, but also the news that the UK with Italy will be hosting next year's COP discussions. And that for me provides an such an important framing for the next 18 months that uh, the work starts, has already started, but absolutely needs to keep at pace for the next 18 months. And uh, so some of the things on your slide are about bringing in those different partners. Perhaps I will start off by giving a little snapshot of where I come from. So I've spent my career working in finance. I now chair the UK's environmental regulator, and we also have responsibility for flood and coastal erosion risk management in England. And I bring that financial private sector expertise to an arm's length body that sits within our Department of Environment. And where I started pushing into different parts of government was on the back of that finance work. So I was asked to be part of the Green Finance Task Force. And as chair of the Environment Agency, I said, absolutely, this was set up to underpin the work of the Clean Growth Strategy. But as the chair of the body responsible for flood and for drought, so the too much water and the too little water here in this country, I was not going to re be restricting my comments to clean growth. This needed to be about clean and resilient um, development in the, within the, the UK framework. And then last October, uh, as the, our former president, Prime Minister had committed to lead on climate resilience throughout this year in the run-up to uh, the climate summit later this month, I was asked whether I would take on the role as the UK's commissioner for the Global Commission on Adaptation. I looked at the people who were co-chairing that, leading that, Ban Ki-moon, Bill Gates, and Kristalina Georgieva. And again, it took me virtually seconds to say, absolutely. Absolutely, I want to be part of this uh, group putting adaptation on the global stage because there's no doubt it, uh, the more I have understood my role as chair of the Environment Agency, the more I have understood the importance of adaptation and resilience and got to know more about trans um, transboundary adaptation, the more I have understood that it's important to really move adaptation and resilience from the sort of Cinderella of the climate change discussions onto properly onto the, the global stage. But I also think it's important in relation to next year to think about those other discussions that are taking place around the sustainable development goals, but also around CBD, the nature cop. Because this, when we come to the systems that we need to work around, it needs to involve all of these discussions and needs to move issues that have often been seen part of uh, the environment departments, part of the international development departments, into the heart of government decision making, whether in the UK or whether you're somewhere else in the world, whether it's in the north, in the south, the developed, the developing, it absolutely needs to be at the forefront of not just the leaders of countries, but the finance ministers, the trade ministers, and be fundamental to all of that decision making whilst weaving in the private sector, the businesses, the investors, and the insurance companies as well. So yesterday, again, I think those of us involved in the Global Commission on Adaptation couldn't have been more pleased, with, certainly from my perspective, watching the news flow from here within the UK at how the story, the work of the Global, uh, Global Commission on Adaptation trended throughout the day on BBC World, but also uh, uh, on other news channels as well. And I think, again, one of the core stories that came through that were being reported on was the um, the importance to the economy of 
strong adaptation and resilience. That there, uh, this is fundamental to any country. That again, the transboundary aspects of this, that nobody is going to be immune or insulated from adaptation risks. That they're playing out right now. And we were talking about what the latest figures are in relation to Hurricane Dorian. And I think the latest figures that we've seen in terms of insurance losses are around six billion dollars. That wherever you are in the world, this is going to have monetary impacts as well as human and nature impacts uh, at a level that really it's about our own survival as opposed to the survival of the planet. And that understanding, putting an economic framing around adaptation, that by investing in five specific, specific areas around just under $2 um, trillion over the next 10 years, bringing about something like $7 trillion worth of um, economic benefits because of the way that we are building um, strength into the uh, how economies respond to the issue of a changing climate. I also think the urgency point is something that is absolutely key as well. And I come back to where I'm sitting right now in my variety of different roles across government, but also with a tiny bit still involved in the private sector, is the urgency of the next 18 months. And I think it's down to everybody in this room and everybody that is listening into this conversation to really make sure that this is not about giving up on uh, low carbon transition, on net zero, our net, net zero work. It's about doubling, trebling, quadrupling our efforts there, but at the same time, making sure that any decision that we're making, particularly through that investment lens, and by that I mean any funds that are being placed towards um, uh, the res resilience and adaptation, that we are looking at joining up that systemic change and creating new and brilliant new um, partnerships as to how we uh, deal with this incredibly important issue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emma. I'll turn now to Ayman uh, in Casablanca. I think you're, uh, given the uh, the background that I outlined earlier, you're very well placed to, uh, to have a go for us at, at outlining um, how our institutions are prepared to, to respond to this challenge, both um, at the national level and then in terms of regional cooperation, and then of course at the UN level, what is, what is happening uh, on this at the UNFCCC. Uh, in relation to, to the Climate Action Summit next week in New York. Uh, please, Ayman, we're keen to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to seize this opportunity to congratulate the United Kingdom for having secured the nomination to host COP26 next year in partnership with Italy. I would also very much like to express how much I welcome the initiative uh, Adaptation Without Borders. Uh, it is very needed, uh, it is very timely, and the potential is simply transformative. And I believe we all need to work together to make sure that that potential is fully captured. Uh, now, um, to, to address the very, uh, um, the, the several points that you, that you identified, uh, I would like to go over three points. Uh, the first of them uh, would like to reflect on some of the implication of transboundary climate risk, as you were saying, for national government and the UNFCCC space. The second point, I wanted to say a few words about the legal ramification, uh, keeping in mind that it is a very broad uh, topic and I only have a few minutes left. And the third and last point I wanted to discuss is uh, the regional aspect that you were referring to in terms of potential cooperation. So on the, on the first point, um, I would like to refer to some of the decisions we reached at the last COP, so the COP24 in Katowice, uh, three of them in particular, uh, the decision on national adaptation plan, the decision on the report of the adaptation committee, which is an important body within the UNFCCC that looks at adaptation, 
And third, the recommendation from the Executive Committee of the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damages. Now, uh, interestingly, if you looked at those decisions, uh, you will see that, uh, and that we, you see that transboundary cooperation is not necessarily mentioned uh, in, in words per se. So that very much, once again, emphasizes the need for the initiative uh, that was referred to earlier. Uh, with one exception, which is the third uh, decision I was referring to, which is the one linked to the uh, recommendation of the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damages. And in that regard, there is an invitation to support and enhance regional cooperation when it comes to uh, addressing uh, displacement related to the adverse impact of climate change. So there is a formal space right there that is important to capture. The second point I wanted to, to uh, discuss briefly uh, here is linked to the uh, Climate Action Summit. Uh, as you may be aware, there is uh, there are nine different coalition tracks, one of them looking at adaptation and, resili and resilience. And one of the goals of uh, this particular adaptation coalition, uh, this work stream, within the work plan that they define for themselves, is to secure commitment to systemic and global, global transformation action that changes the way we plan and invest to secure food and water. So, uh, Quite a few of the speakers before I, 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 see, I, see, I, kept, I got the floor refer to the systemic risk, to, the, to looking at this issue as a system. And this is something that I believe in terms of language, in terms of, of uh, approach, is very important to keep in mind. And I'm quite happy to see that there's coherence between the conversations that are taking place today in London and what is to take place in New York in a couple of weeks. The second point out of three I wanted to discuss with you is the uh, legal aspect. And uh, I would like to, ref to refer to the uh, very helpful uh, introductory slide that was shared by Rebecca earlier when she introduced the uh, two types of risks and four types of pathways. So the risks that are created by the impacts of climate change themselves and the risks that are created by our response to those impacts and risks. Uh, and the four pathways are, as well being people, finance, trade and biophysical. I think this is a very helpful way to look at this issue. As you can, as you can imagine, uh, law looks at all those aspects. As such, uh, law is a very broad uh, domain. It, takes, it has different uh, dimensions. Uh, I won't have the ambition of even pretending to be able to address all of them, but I would like to very briefly say a few words about three uh, topics, three uh, domains of, uh, of law in general. So one being trade, the second being the environment, and the third being human rights. So looking at trade, uh, I wanted to share with you two figures uh, from the very uh, helpful uh, report that was referred uh, to earlier by Emma that was released yesterday by the Global Commission on Adaptation. Uh, the first uh, figure I wanted to share with you is the fact that without adaptation, climate change may depress growth in global agriculture yields up to 30% by 2050. As you can Im imagine, that could have absolutely devastating impacts on our ability to to sustain uh, livelihood, but also to simply feed uh, the population that is currently existing, but also the population growth to expect by 2050. And that does have legal implication when it comes to the management of global supply chain, because looking at law is not only looking at the relationship uh, between governments, looking at international law is not only looking at that, but as you can imagine, it's also looking at the relationship between all kinds of stakeholders, including the private sector, which is very important when you consider adaptation. The second uh, figure I wanted to share with you is the fact that the number of people who may lack sufficient water at least one month per year will soar from 3.6 billion today to more than 5 billion by 2050. Uh, as you may know, in 2010, uh, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution recognizing the right to safe and clean drinking water. So, it has clear uh, legal implication of them in terms of human rights. Uh, looking on uh, another another point I wanted to share when it comes to the interface between human rights and climate change is to invite you to consider the uh, resolution 3233 that was uh, adopted in 2016 by the Human Rights Commission. Now, I'm aware of time, so I won't go over all the various uh, documents that I believe are of use uh, to consider in the context of international environmental law. Uh, and I'll go straight to my last point, which is the one linked to the important role that regional initiatives, regional organizations may play. And looking at regional uh, bodies, um, an important uh, element to keep in mind is the fact that while at the global stage we have Agenda 2030, at the regional level you have all kinds of agendas, commitments that are quite useful when it comes to hinging 
uh, action for adaptation, in particular transboundary cooperation around climate adaptation within a continental space. And uh, being from Africa, I would like to say a few words about Agenda 2063 being the relevant agenda in the context of our continent. Uh, specifically, the first aspiration of that agenda is for a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. And there is a specific goal with that, within that aspiration that is looking at climate resilient economies and communities. So that connects once again very well to the opening comments that were made by James earlier and the comment just now shared by Emma about the importance of looking at this issue from a broad perspective. And the very last point I wanted to make on this particular uh, uh, topic is linked to some examples of concrete initiatives that are already uh, looking at transboundary cooperation for climate action with a specific focus on adaptation. The first of them being the African Adaptation Initiative, being an important initiative, uh, the AAA as the, uh, the, African, the adaptation of African agriculture, as the agricultural element of this uh, African Adaptation Initiative is also something that I believe should be paid attention to. And uh, lastly, in terms of regional initiative, uh, some, um, some other initiatives that have been announced in the case of uh, regional cooperation in Africa being linked to the, um, the uh, region of the Sahel, the region of the Congo Basin, as well as uh, island developing state in Africa, once again looking at adaptation as an important aspect of climate change action. Uh, also, another topic linked to Africa and regional cooperation is the transformational potential of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, James was referring to trade, Emma referred to her background in terms of uh, investment, and as such, this African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is a very exciting development, could provide an interesting space to, to, to discuss uh, transplanetary climate um, uh, adaptation. So given uh, the time that was allocated to me, I will rest here. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Simon. So we've had from Rebecca a very helpful overview of the rather dizzying breadth um, of, uh, of impact, the scope of, of transboundary impacts. We've had from, uh, from Emma uh, a sense of the scale of the challenge. And you know, I, I got listening to you, Emma, a very strong sense that really this is only just beginning to, to break through into the sectors that urgently need to, to start responding uh, and taking, taking into account uh, the, these risks. Uh, and from uh, Ayman, a sense of how this is um, edging onto the global agenda, um, some, uh, an interesting insight into the legal position and some of those very sobering statistics that we, that we heard from you that are, again outline the, the scale of the challenge. So we've got about 15 minutes next for a, um, for a panel discussion um, before we turn outwards to, uh, to others. Um, and I'd like to open that by asking each of you on the panel to reflect on this question as to uh, how well prepared we are um, in terms of uh, institutions, uh, in terms of uh, our politics, uh, in terms of regulation, financial flows, how well prepared are we uh, to take into account the transboundary impacts of climate change? Um, do you share this sense that, uh, that these impacts have been underestimated, that they've been missing from the global debate? Uh, and if so, um, how, do we, how do we move forward? How do we move this... Uh, how do we mainstream this agenda into all of the industries that have been mentioned? Finance, trade, uh, the multilateral institutions, uh, and so on. Can I turn first to Rebecca on that? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, James. Strangely, uh, despite what we've, what we've just started by saying, I, I feel quite optimistic, actually, because, as we heard from Iman and, and from Emma and James, that, that there is actually a substantial amount of knowledge um, and learning that we already have. For example, there are a number of regulatory um, frameworks. So we have the Water Convention, um, we have UNCCD, we have the CBD, all um, legally <coughs> and binding, plus a whole range of other um, 
legal frameworks to, for managing, for example, um, transboundary water resources. Um, as I said as well, there's a number of initiatives, the um, African Adaptation Initiative, we have the Great Green Wall um, Initiative under UNCCD for managing um, land degradation, and they take a landscape view to this. The challenge, I think, though, is that despite all of these different initiatives, there's no sense of this necessarily being, being joined up, and there are a number of sort of key parties that are missing from that um, discussion. Um, I think perhaps those more in the finance and the, the trade um, side of things. But what I'm saying is that there is a foundation upon which we can build. We're not actually starting from ground zero in terms of developing our regulatory or our governance mechanisms. And of course, we have um, the climate convention. Um, but what we need to do is bring those issues um, of transboundary climate risk higher up in the, the, the climate convention and then enable the climate convention and the other conventions that are looking at these issues to talk to um, each other. Mm. Do you think it's true to say that, that we're doing better at recognising and responding to these kinds of risk um, at a cross-border level, at a regional level, and not so well uh, so far at seeing those hidden connections, what our friends at, at SEI call uh, teleconnected risks, um, uh, like the, the case of the, the uh, rice imports into yeah. Senegal that you mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah, I think we are actually at the moment better at understanding the biophysical, um, the, the, the risks associated with um, shared natural resources. Mm. Um, and, and there are a number as well of, of regional bodies um, looking um, at the, these issues as well. Um, but, of course, they're highly political. Yes. <laughs> OK. Um, Emma, please. So I flip-flop from being optimistic <laughs> to quite gloomy. And, I, I mean, you gave a great summary of some of the key findings from the Global Commission on Ad Adaptations report yesterday. And those are staggering figures, staggering figures. And one of the events that I often have, I've been referring to this year that sent shivers down my spine was when the chief executive of the Institute of Chartered Accounting, England and Wales, talked about reporting from a corporate perspective and basically said, since the whole COP process began, all we have done as businesses is lay down the audit trail of our demise. Because let's face it, for all the work that the investment and corporate sector is now doing in this space, we, are n we have not yet shifted in the right direction. But then I get into my optimistic space because there is no doubt that we have the foundations, as, as Rebecca has um, eloquently talked about, of making things start to happen. And we also have that... Uh, that, 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 that need, I think this was James, you, you talked about it, that, that the things that we aren't yet aware of that will come our way and shock us and, um, you know, drive us, the, tri the new tribes, etc., that will allow things to happen at a different pace. Who would have imagined that just over a year ago, a young woman sitting outside a building would create the movement that we now have. And I often might find myself in discussions like this, channeling Greta yeah. and her colleagues, her brilliant climate striker youth, who are asking the most brilliant and incisive and direct questions holding us to account. And that's where I have my moments of, you know, we can pace, move at pace, if we have the right will and the mechanisms, but we are staring over this um, very short period of time where we have to start acting. And I think that's where, you know, I will bring my spirit of the next 18 months is crucial. We also have to start la talking a language that resonates with the mainstream investment community, the mainstream business community. Because, frankly, sometimes the way we who have lived and breathed this stuff for now, in many cases, for decades, are still not landing those core messages for those people who are the decision makers and, with the right will, will start moving at pace and moving in the right direction. So, yeah, professionally optimistic because I don't think we have any other choice, but we have to drive at pace. Mm.
May I just Go, please. riff on that because it's helpful? Um, I don't know whether any of you have read uh, Blueprint, uh, Nick Christakis's book. Professor Nick uh, Christakis at, uh, at Yale has written this book called Blueprint, years of research, uh, understanding what it is that makes human society work, what social norms, what, what he calls a social suite. And he, he, but he's connected this to our, to our evolution. And I think what Greta has done is she's, she's arrived when we're ready to listen to the direct message of a young woman with, a, with, a, with a, 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 an apparent disability that turns out to be a strength, which is that she has an honesty that cuts straight through. And uh, that is simply explaining to us in plain terms that we are at risk as humanity from something of our own making and therefore something that we can resolve. And it's that bridge that allows you to be rationally and emotionally aligned when you are both pessimistic and optimistic at the same time. Because the level of the risk is matched by our capacity to solve our own problem. Now, there are critical areas of our response that are underdeveloped, although I do believe we have a solid base. We've been talking about adaptation for a long time, from very simple things, from hard walls to mangrove swamps to you know, various types of geophysical response, but we never really got deep into the interconnectedness. We haven't fully owned up to how interconnected we already are, let alone how we need to be more so in order to solve the problem. And there are countless examples of these ripples out from our, from investment is actually quite a good system to look at. So uh, one of the reasons why I think we have failed to do enough to respond to the obvious uh, risk to our financial system from climate change is because if we really got to grips of it, it would make an awful lot of existing investments less valuable in a way which is worrying and frightening. The amount of agricultural property at the sea level, the amount of infrastructure that's affected by sea level rise, uh, the amount of real estate that has to be completely revalued because it genuinely is at risk. Look at the, you know, look at the, look at Miami, look at various uh, substantial uh, holders of property value that really ought to be rethought. And I don't know if you remember a report that uh, Deutsche Bank did last year, or DFS as they now is, their research department. Um, did a piece of work which was uncomfortable to read about the uh, repricing of risk in uh, emerging market debt as a result of the physical consequences of climate change. And it just compounded the unfairness that we know exists, that climate change does not fall fairly or equally on those around the world. It's universal, but it doesn't land in a, in a, in a, in a way that is, uh, corresponds to what would be right and just. Uh, but, but if you look carefully at those countries that are most exposed to climate risk, there are also people who have to pay a very high price for raising money. The cost of capital in those places is already high. So these are compounded risks. Uh, this, this is, these are additional burdens associated uh, with climate change. But there is a circularity because a lot of the risk is underwritten here in our markets in London, in our insurance markets, will come back and hit us. A lot of the ownership of, of globalized industries is exposed to risk in many different jurisdictions. Well, the ownership will come back here and be registered in our stock exchange and the, and the, uh, and the risk to, to the owners of those stocks. So the deeper we go into this, the more we will realize how interconnected we are and how we need to cooperate to fix that problem. And when we do that, as I said, in, as I, we have to be open to where these answers come from. We do not have all the answers here in this jurisdiction. We just don't. There are many learnings to be had from others. And as we explore, we will find, I think, that our institutions are simply not good enough to make those connections, and we have to invest more of them. And this is ironic, because it's at a time when there's a lot of challenge to multilateralism, there's a lot of nationalism, a lot of protectionism emerging, and it's exactly the wrong approach to dealing with a systems problem like this. Thank you, James. Just before we, we move on to Ayman and turn, turn back to 
the institutional preparedness. I, since you both mentioned Greta Thunberg, I don't want to uh, let civil society and the climate justice movement off without a, a challenge to them too. And I, what I, what's been playing on my mind is the question as to, you know, the, the, the focus of those movements is, is perhaps quite rightly um, uh, largely on mitigation, on the need to, to get emissions down. Um, but ha has enough been done to, uh, to break through into civil society, into uh, that global climate movement, um, to, to engage that movement on adaptation and on specifically uh, transboundary risk? Do you, uh, uh, are, we, are we taking advantage uh, of that resource sufficiently? I wonder if you have any reflection on, on that, Emma. I, I think we're still probably at the early stages of it. Mm. I mean, uh, we in, I, I'm very, very practical. I like we're I'm chairing a delivery body, so I like to get on very quickly and start doing things. Mm. And uh, and we have invited young people in to challenges. So when we launched our flood and coastal erosion risk management strategy back in May. We launched it at Brunel University because that is where we are training the next generation of flood engineers who could work in this country or could work in other countries. And uh, again, but that was very, you know, very partly tactical, partly working with a, 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 an, an audience of young people who get it. I don't think when you look at the Thames Barrier, and I talked about it yesterday when I gave a, a speech, that the majority of people understand some of the defences that we have up and down the country and how they're not only acting, particularly the ones which are more natural, as protecting from flooding, but they're also acting as carbon sinks. And the more I wander around the work that we as the Environment Agency have done in this country, I'm challenging the stories that we are telling about what this is that I am visiting and what it is doing, not just uh, around habitat and nature, but protecting from climate change. So I think that there's a whole narrative that we need to sort of grasp right now to start showing what it is that we're doing when we're working on rivers for around too much and too little water. But you have to remember that people who are living at flood risk don't necessarily want to admit that either because of the, uh, and so whether it's at a community level or at a household level or at a you know country level, it's the, by putting that label on a place, you are calling out the risk. But I've also seen where we have gone in with schemes that involve not just concrete, but nature-based solutions as well. You flip it on the side and there is a value that, it, um, you turn it on its head, and there is a value that is created that we should also be unlocking to bring back to invest more in those parts of our country or other parts of the world that are then protected, albeit there will always be some residual risk to the, the impacts that we're, we're, we're um, we're facing. So it, it's really tricky, but you, you can change a place by the way you work with it to build in those resilience measures. Anyone want to, else can want to come in quickly on that question yeah, of would, popular engagement? I, I don't think you should get in the way of the energy that is being generated by the, the movement at the moment. Let them go, let them go as hard and as fast as they want, and some nuances will, will, will have to be contributed by others, no, not least this kind of work. But I do think also there's something alluring in the, uh, in the effort to collaborate that you can connect to adaptation. Right? So that there's, a, there's, a, there's a deep community engagement to place and to, and to protecting place as well that you care about. And that could be improving the, the natural flood defences. It could be improving the capacity to, to sequester carbon in a in a restoration of a forest or a, or a peatland or a, um, or, or, or a coastal zone that needs its uh, you need to transport, you know, a mangrove grown or, or, or reed beds improved. Um, there's, there's work to be done there uh, collectively to improve resilience. And then I think there's also something which uh, the, 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 the movement inspired to challenge decision makers uh, it can be useful for the choices they make when, when they build infrastructure. What kind of infrastructure? Where? In what way? For what purpose? For what system do we want to create? 
if, 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 the, if the climate movement in its various guises uh, puts pressure on decision makers in government, in finance, in, in, in business to build something different, better, it will be more resilient, it will be cleaner. Because let's face it, one of the things that will, I think, emerge in the next phase of this conversation is that, that the new stuff is better than the old stuff. You know, we're going to win this debate. We are, the, 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 the clean energy uh, winners are clear and obvious now. And they're, they're not the existing fossil fuel companies. Uh, there, are, there, is a, there is a victory in sight in clean energy, transportation, the interconnection between the two. And I think for that, for, for Greta's generation, that's something that we can offer them. You know, you provide a pressure, we'll make decisions to make sure the infrastructure that you inherit in 10, 20 years' time is clean, it's more stable, it has lower geopolitical risk, it has many other benefits, and it will get to grips with climate change. Thank you. Um, Ironman, would you like to come in on this uh, broader question of our levels of preparedness? Uh, sure, with pleasure. So, um, uh, well, if I may a bit mis be a bit mischievous, uh, I'm going to share with you, um, if I myself some of your time, and share with you the, the title of a report uh, that was made by the Secretary General of the United Nations back in 2018. And I think to a certain extent, so there's a lot of things that get communicated by that title. It's quite a mouthful, so I will ask for your patience. So it was a report to consider a technical and evidence-based report that identified and assessed possible gaps in international environmental law and environment-related instruments with a view to strengthening their implementation and discuss possible options to address possible gaps in international environmental law and environment-related instruments as appropriate and, if deemed necessary, to scope parameters and feasibility of an international instrument with a view to making recommendations which might include the convening of an intergovernmental conference to adopt an interna international instrument. So uh, I think uh, the, the report, the the report itself is, is is quite interesting. I would invite you to read it. And the uh, uh, the report that came also a couple of months ago, uh, subsequent to that report, uh, I, clearly, uh, well, there's uh, as as was said, uh, a tremendous amount of expertise over many years that has been uh, developed, that has been refined. There's very interesting work also ongoing in terms of uh, measuring adaptation and uh, and looking at adaptation uh, through a transplanetary prism. Uh, at the same time, there's clearly a, a sense of disconnect at times between the, some what needs to be done on the ground and the consideration that perhaps uh, fail to adequately take into account the urgency. Uh, to act and uh, really take seriously this uh, this urgent issue. Uh, the second point I wanted to this far shorter uh, was a reaction to uh, Rebecca mentioning the uh, UNCCD COP. So UNCCD being the convention to combat desertification, uh, the COP is taking place right now. And uh, I wanted to refer to that because a couple of days ago, the Prime Minister Modi uh, said that India would be happy to propose initiatives for greater cooperation in addressing issues of climate change, biodiversity and land degradation. So that is also an important uh, stakeholder to on board, I would assume, in this kind of cooperation when it comes to transboundary climate risks and take into account the broader conversation, not only on climate change as a silo, but also taking into account biodiversity, as was referred to by Emma, and land degradation as an important topic. And the very last point I wanted to make, I promise, uh, is linked to um, youth and the conversation, the very important conversation that you were just having. Uh, and my sense that uh, youth and the movement that we are all uh, observing and uh, many of us are inspired and amazed by is a proof that trans addressing transboundary climate risk is already happening. And youth is taking the lead in that regard. When you look at Fridays of the Future, how, how it got organized, the impact that it had, while it may not say uh, in uh, ad ver uh, verbatim uh, transboundary climate risk, but that is what they are also addressing by their mobilization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I was going to ask you each um, what your reasons for optimism are, but I, I, think, uh, I think we've heard spontaneously from, uh, from all of, almost all of you the answers to those questions. So I wonder, just before we open up, I wonder if we might just take an extra moment to identify some of the windows of political opportunity for driving this agenda forward.
um, both at the UN level uh, and elsewhere. Um, perhaps in your role as, as our representative to the Global Commission, Emma, you might want to respond to that question and identify a couple of the, the coming windows of opportunity. One of the things I've been saying over the last uh, couple of years when I've been asked my views on other political things that are going on in this country is expect the unexpected. And so if we just go back a couple of months, suddenly there was an opportunity when our former Prime Minister had signalled her resignation to do something really significant about net zero. And there was a movement partly inspired by the climate strikes, the Extinction Rebellion events that had taken place over Easter. You suddenly got our members of parliament, our scientists, the business community, investors, ready to make a call. And within a very, very short time frame, something flipped and we were able to get agreement to a net zero um, and legislation in place in a very, very short window. So whilst we could spend a lot of time going right in the run up to COP26, there is um, starting in 10 days time in New York and COP25 and Davos and blah, blah, blah. We also have to be ready for those moments where suddenly the alignment is right and something surprising can happen. And again, that is where uh, discussions like this and action and bringing to together different combinations of uh, organizations, public, private, third sector, can mean you're suddenly ready to push over um, an initiative from a political perspective. And I think those are the moments that we have to look out for, not least because wherever you're looking at the moment from a political perspective, there is change coming up. There are elections that we're going to face, uh, whether it's in this country or in other countries, and making the most of that uh, also clear signal that we are now getting from young people from um, others joining those movements for a political shift is going to be absolutely key. So I think how we don't just wait for those, the calendar of events that have been going now for 26 years, 25 years, but also those moments where suddenly you can drive through something. That, that, that again, is where I get my hope and optimism. And it may be not just at the country level, but uh, around financial regulation, around a group of central bankers, around a group of ministers of finance, and where suddenly you push them over to get a much greater... Um, again, ability to act, because ultimately, none of what, unless we start acting on what we know and start making a real difference with the way we are investing in infrastructure, investing our development budgets, etc., etc., we are not going to meet the challenge that we face. Yeah. Thank you. And without getting too much into uh, in the run-up to the calendar events, I will do a quick plug for UK government action on this. Um, the UN Secretary-General in advance of the Climate Action Summit in New York next week has invited, has invited the, the UK uh, to take the lead on what they're calling the resilience pillar uh, at that summit. And, uh, and you'll hear uh, some announcements uh, a week on Sunday, the 22nd of September, and on the 23rd um, at the summit itself. Uh, there's been a, a, a mighty cross-government effort in the UK led by DFID, the Department for International Development, but uh, with lots of cooperation from Bayes, uh, uh, the, the uh, department uh, with the responsibility for climate change and also from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and coordinated by the Cabinet Office. Uh, a lot of work has gone into a, a platform, a proposal for a work plan on resilience which will be uh, revealed and proposed at that summit so please do look out for that announcement. Um, Notwithstanding the UK leadership, I think it's also important to recognise the other countries and organisations that have been part of that because again we're only going to make progress by working in um, collaboration. Yes, thank you. Um, let me turn to you, Ayman. I know you'd like to, to say a few words about windows of opportunity at the UN level. 
Uh, certainly, with uh, with pleasure. And you you uh, referred to just now to the important work on the pillar of adaptation and, and resilience that is currently being co-led by by the UK and Egypt with the support of uh, of many partners. But the Climate Action Summit that is taking place on the 23rd uh, has many different pillars because it is such a holistic issue that we need to. To, to tackle. And uh, in that regard, there is a very important uh, high-level space for engagement uh, at that particular point in time because of the fact that it's designed to take place at the same time as the General Assembly. So there will be high-level engagement from head of state, head of government. So that in itself is a tremendous opportunity. You also refer to the preparatory meeting on the weekend before the 22nd. But I, I wanted to also add the fact that on the 21st, there will be a youth climate action summit that will be convened uh, at a high level in New York at the United Nations headquarters. So that is also an important space to, to highlight the type of transformative initiatives that could uh, that are already existing that could benefit from further support, but to launch some new initiative of cooperation for cooperation in the context of climate. Uh, other opportunities that will be important is the context of, of course, the pre-COP that will take place in Costa Rica, the COP uh, with the tremendous work currently being done by the incoming presidency of uh, Chile for COP25. Uh, next year is going to be a very important year with the combination of uh, the COP uh, that I believe will be taking place in Glasgow, of course, uh, to be confirmed officially, uh, due, formally, I guess, during COP25. Uh, but, I mean, all the indicators, I would assume, are very, very green. And we love green. We are a community that is uh, very, very green. Uh, and uh, the, also the Beijing COP, when it comes to biodiversity, being another important international space uh, for cooperation and engagement around the holistic and integrated approach we need to take to tackle climate change within the context of sustainable development. But uh, outside of this uh, very formal uh, sequence of events that Emma was referring to, that uh, to a certain extent we've been uh, going over for 25 years and making progress, I, uh, I would like to say, it's also important to keep in mind the national element. Uh, because a lot of the work takes place at the national level and a big part of the beauty of adaptation is in this complexity. Uh, and in the amount of stakeholders you need to include when you have to address this topic. And in that regard, a lot of countries are working on finalizing the national adaptation plan. And that provides a very important space where you can highlight uh, the kind of uh, initiative cooperation and also identify the kind of transboundary uh, cooperation you would like to see specifically uh, around, like, uh, around climate change when it comes to the plans that your country would like to implement. So this is also an important political space, and uh, I would strongly invite you to keep a close eye on uh, what is currently uh, defined, what is the state of play when it comes to this national adaptation plan, what are some important key dates that are still to come, so that you try to engage with that as well. Thank you very much, Aima. Now, there are about 25 minutes remaining to us, and uh, we'd like to take the bulk of that time uh, for questions and answers from the floor and from the online audience. Just before we do that, um, we've just lined up a few, we've asked a few uh, respondents to, to offer some brief reflections from different sectors. Um, so Ayman, uh, Earl, in his earlier remarks, um, presented us with the terrifying statistics in, in terms of the projections in terms of water insecurity and very uh, well placed to respond to that is Ken Caldwell who's the executive director of Water Aid International. If I could go to you first please Ken. Thank you. Um, thank you for those comments and a really is an interesting presentation. Uh, from I want to pick up your challenge James about uh, what civil society doing about climate change adaptation. From Water Aid's perspective, all of our work on climate change is around adaptation, and there are many others working in this field too, so it's not just getting started now. Uh, I want to make three very quick points. First of all, uh, we see water scarcity as the front, the sharp end of climate change adaptation for the poorest households in the world. It will have bigger effects on them than almost any other factor short of the ones that are directly affected by natural disasters. It's going to affect mal malnutrition, it's going to affect uh, public health, it's going to affect displacement in all sorts of ways. And uh, therefore, water scarcity is a critical part of what this is about. Secondly, water scarcity is inherently a transboundary issue in most of the developing world. 
And in the UK, we sometimes struggle with this because we don't know much about transboundary water in the UK because we're an island. Uh, but uh, to give you an illustration of Africa, the three bigger river basins in Africa, Nile, Congo, and Niger, uh, almost half the population of Africa lives in those three shared river basins, and they cross 26 countries in Africa. So this is fundamentally a transboundary issue uh, of water scarcity that we can only solve in transboundary terms. The third message I want to leave with you in relation to water scarcity is the solution to this uh, has to fundamentally engage agriculture because in the developing world, 80% of our freshwater resources are used by agriculture. And we will only address this by transforming agricultural practices and the selection of crops that we use and that's not an issue, only an issue for farmers and for governments in the countries that are producing, but it's also an issue for us in consuming countries in the things that we choose to consume. And if you're interested in more of that, WaterAid's State of the World's Water Report 2019 talks about the water footprint of different crops this year uh, and uh, how those will affect the water scarcity in years to come. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, Nathaniel Matthews, as, as Programme Director at the Global Resilience Partnership, you're responsible for coordinating hundreds of civil society bodies on, uh, on res uh, responses to climate change and, uh, and, and risk and resilience. So you may well have further reflections on this civil society question, please. Thank you very much. And I think this builds off of um, what you just mentioned as well, Ken. But just take a moment to reflect on the impacts of transboundary climate risks on the most vulnerable people and places. So really, when we think about this casual architecture that connects risk and crisis in one discrete area with other discrete areas, this for me really requires a reconceptualization of risk. And that requires a taking into account the human environmental processes that shape these new transboundary climate risks. And, and some of this, as Rebecca highlighted in 2011, but um, with, with the floods in Bangkok, but we can also think about this, you know, again, from a perspective of India, for example, it's groundwater pumping at the moment contributes in some months up to 40% of the rainfall in Eastern Africa. And so that, that creates really profound governance challenges for how to manage that. So if, for example, if India starts to be more sustainable in its groundwater pumping, how will that then impact on farmers and other of the most vulnerable people across Africa? And it is really those vulnerable people that are really challenged at the moment, or, or will be significantly challenged by transboundary climate risks because they lack the, the luxury of coping mechanisms that uh, are ex existent in more affluent states. So a fundamental part of addressing these risks will be really the, um, um, addressing the pronounced uh, environmental and social injustices that perpetuate them. And this, for me, really needs novel ways of stewarding our ecosystems, novel ways of, of creating our livelihood base. And, and that will require innovation and, and investment from many different sectors. And the, the Global Commission on Adaptation Report really shows the, the potential of that investment as well, which is exciting. And I would just finally add that this is not really thinking about the most vulnerable people in places in terms of victimhood. It's, it's really about thinking about their agency to thrive and, and supporting that agency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathaniel. Uh, and uh, while we have talked about impacts on the finance sector and financial flows, we haven't yet had a private sector perspective. So very happy to hear some reflections now from Lip Ping Lo, who's Assistant Director at PwC. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, yeah, so we work a fair bit with government as well, but I'm sort of asked to come from a private sector perspective. So um, we work a lot with multinationals, and multinationals are kind of looking at the title of this uh, presentation. You know, they manage climate risks and they manage across borders. So they, in some ways, uh, multinationals represent a microcosm of some of the challenges that we face here. Um, and we've worked with many of them. Um, there are retailers um, that that have looked at their uh, climate risk to their agri uh, their produce and have declared that you know 95% of fruits and vegetables to a particular retailer in a, uh, a supermarket in the UK will be at risk from climate change, and then the question is how do they uh, manage that risk and react to that risk? So the good news is there are you know positive case studies of um, multinationals that are ma actively looking at this, uh, going out and thinking about where are they sourcing products from, uh, how, do, how do they manage them, where are their people based around all the offices and supply chains around the world, how do we protect them, um, and you know, how do they kind of 
uh, look at infrastructure and communities that they operate in. So businesses are doing that. I guess the the challenge um, that we we see is that because they are managing risk from their perspectives, then some of the sort of broader uh, you know, interdependencies might be less looked after. So, um, so, I, so I'm really pleased to see this initiative, and you know, be will will be great. Uh, you know, it will be great if we can see how we could work with the business community so that they manage their you know um, risk within their business borders across countries, but also you know with others as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Ping. Um, Right, um, we've got lots of questions coming through uh, from the live stream. I'm going to uh, I'm going to alternate between questions from from the floor in the room and questions from the live stream. I think so. Would you like to just show your hand if you'd like to uh, to ask a question? Please uh, go ahead. The woman in the uh, in the left hand row. Right Thank you. Can you hear me? My name's Erin Roberts. I'm a research associate here at ODI. Um, I just wanted to pick up on some of the com comments about the climate emergency and the climate movement. So in, in my view, loss and damage is really the poster child of the climate emergency. And yet, as you mentioned, James Core, the climate emergency has really more highlighted the importance of mitigation action. And so from, from my perspective and from many others, we really need to broaden that to look at the full spectrum of climate action. So I'm part of a group of researchers, of practitioners, of negotiators that are working on loss and damage, and we're trying to change the narrative. So to broaden the narrative, to focus more on averting, minimizing, and addressing loss and damage, which is acknowledged by the Paris Agreement. But it's not easy. And one of the reasons it's not easy is because when you highlight the importance of adaptation, it necessarily highlights the importance of adaptation in the most vulnerable countries and communities. And that brings in an element of support and finance for adaptation. So these are some of the challenges that we're facing. Ayman talked about the Africa Adaptation Initiative, which is a great initiative working in Africa, 54 countries in Africa, but it's severely under-resourced. So I'd really love to hear from the panel how can we support the most vulnerable, not just vulnerable countries, but also vulnerable communities? Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Um, I'll take, uh, I'm going to take a, a few questions. Uh, I'll take a block of questions and then come back for responses from the panelists. So please do note down those that you'd like to, to respond to. Um, so um, Rita Zacharias, who's writing to us from Mozambique uh, and works for DFID there, um, is asking a question in relation to how we break down, uh, break down the silos in the adaptation planning sector. Um, and she's saying, what, how could we in, uh, engage countries? Um, uh, how could we collaborate to improve the capacity to better plan for, for transboundary climate risk? Uh, how do we uh, mainstream this and include it in national adaptation planning? Um, so I'll go to a next question from the floor. I think this, uh, this gentleman in front, uh, just in front of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Graham Wynn. I'm one of the authors of the um, Global Commission's on Adaptations report. Um, I'd like to go back to something Rebecca said right at the beginning. I agree with Rebecca that the biophysical um, risks that are transferred are probably better understood than some of the others. Two points. One, I suggest that they're far from understood, however. And I think as we start looking at, for example, um, high-level atmospheric movement of moisture, uh, linking, as you know, the Amazon to the Midwest of the States, or the Congo Basin to Eastern Africa and so on, I think these issues are even bigger and more systemic than we've began to describe so far. I think the other point is that the, what we, I think James probably picked this up, but I'd like to stress it, that the intersection between the biophysical risks, the social and the economic, and the playbacks through the system absolutely aren't properly recognized yet. Or dealt with. I would say even in the UK, let alone globally. But looking at the international level, I suppose turning this into a question, what are those cross-boundary international institutions that could do most in the short term, practically, 
through additional resources, through improvement, etc. I'd love the panel's views on where our ODA, other international aid, could get to it. Some of the presumably some of the water uh, water management basin authorities, whatever. But I'd like some views, please, there, because I, I have to be honest. If my colleagues from the Global Commission are watching, forgive me. I don't think we've act actually nailed this yet in terms of the practical cross-boundary international steps that can be taken. We've come up with some ideas, but I think these need to be evolved rapidly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the questions from the live stream um, takes that a, a little further and raises the, the question of um, how this transboundary adaptation agenda uh, uh, brings with it questions and challenges in, in relation to sovereignty. Um, this is from a, a, an anonymous question. This questioner is asking uh, uh, about uh, the ways in which countries that are very deeply rooted in, in economic development as, as their national narrative may not readily accept um, these kinds of transboundary interventions. And I guess we, we, all, we naturally think of things like um, uh, upstream countries' uh, 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 responsibilities uh, in relation to, to downstream uses of water in, in other countries. Um, you know, what, and this person is asking, what what are the uh, policies and 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 measures? What are the strategies, I suppose, for bringing those countries and and that way of thinking, bringing those people into the fold? Um, let's take one more from the floor, please. Hello. Um, I just had a question on uh, how the Global Commission um, on Adaptation Representative will um, look into, will react on the legal framework that's uh, to look at climate risks. Thank you. Thank you. It relates to, 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 to Ayman's points, doesn't it? Okay, maybe I should pause for a moment um, so not to build up too many questions and, and offer an opportunity for, for responses. Um, no need for, for all of you to respond to, to everything, but just cho choose those questions that you'd like to respond to. Could I start with you, Ayman? Me? Sure, certainly. Um, so, okay, well, I'll, I'll take a couple. When it comes to, uh, oh, first I would like to say hi to Erin, who uh, said a question earlier, I could see at the bottom of the screen, a good friend of mine. Uh, happy to see you uh, asking such an important question. And I think we could connect it as well to the point that was said about uh, how to support uh, cross-disciplinary institution when it comes to delivering impact uh, and it's really important to keep in mind the needs and constraints and the realities of the most vulnerable countries and the fact that how do you how do you define impact really uh, I think it's a uh, it's about having an honest conversation and honest look about how, what kind of metrics that are to be used to define impact. Uh, when it comes to adaptation in particular, as, uh, as Richard know, we've worked a lot on that, but uh, there's still more work to be done, that, that's quite clear. Uh, I wanted to address, uh, as the last question I wanted to respond to, uh, the point around uh, economic development. And I, I think at this point in time, it's critical that uh, we acknowledge uh, the shift in terms of uh, how we frame the, the need to act for adaptation. Uh, over many years now, over several years, we've always been talking about the need to build, for example, the business case for adaptation, why the private sector must act, why, why all these things need to happen. But gradually, and I think Clearly this year, uh, we're seeing more and more of that. It's not about uh, building the business case for adaptation as much as it, as it is for those that are not taking action to justify themselves when it comes to why they're not taking action. Because the standard at this point in time is really about adapting your, your processes, taking into account the impacts of climate change is clear, uh, clearly uh, evident, there's clear evidence for that, whether it is from the um, research from academia, looking at the, all the different pathways that were uh, identified earlier by, uh, by Rebecca and, uh, and once again highlighted by the members of the global, the member of the Global Com Commission on Adaptation that just ask the question from the floor. So clearly, when it comes to economic development, I think to a certain extent, uh, if there is such a narrative, it is about rejecting that narrative and see, saying it's not, the onus is not on us. Uh, if I were to really misuse uh, a legal, legal terminology, the burden of proof is not on us to prove that one must act for climate change. It is on you to explain to us and to your shareholders and to your stakeholders why you are not acting to take into account the risk 
of climate of um, uh, in ad not adapting to climate change, whether it is at the local, national, or transboundary level. Thank you. Thank you, Ayman. James. So there are so many good questions there, and, and I'll do my best. But I'd I'd love the conversation to continue in another form, Graham. I think there's, there's lots to do. How do we deal with the most vulnerable? given the limitations in the loss and damage process. Actually, I think what you're doing at the moment is very good to slightly shift the language a bit so that the space created for flows of public money that could be seen as a, uh, increasing resilience without it being labelled payment for liability. I think it's also useful to open up the conversation about how uh, insurance, both private sector insurance and insurance that is essentially underwritten by governments could be used to assist in if like real world adaptation. Uh, there are huge difficulties there across, across the world. I mean, just to pick a city example, because it's uh, right, right now on the east coast of the US, there, there will be uh, homes that have been damaged by uh, Hurricane Dorian that uh, cannot get private insurance for very sensible reasons, uh, but the state will subsidize that, the state will pay for that. Um, it, it's a huge subsidy uh, in all these parts of the world, but we're not having an honest and open conversation about who is paying for someone to carry on living, in some cases in very expensive properties, exposed to that kind of risk. So I think it gets back a little bit to a version anyway of what Ayman was saying. So uh, I, think, I think there is space to have a conversation, if you like, about compensation that isn't, strictly speaking, compensation, but provides better resources for adaptation in places that are most run vulnerable. The problem, of course, is that it's a huge space. I mean, I, I spent years working with the small islands. It's very obvious there, but it's just as obvious in areas that are heavily populated at low levels and all around the world in all sorts of countries. It's not an answer to your question, but I think you're heading in the right direction, and I think you should persevere. But it also links to Graham's point about what institutions have we got, and, and you know, I'm, I'm suggesting that we don't have adequate institutions to do this work. Uh, if you look at what we have and could we could they provide more help, I do think there's a serious conversation to return to in the WTO, where for years we had, well, we tried hard, but we still had environment versus trade. Uh, and now for several good reasons, we can have a sensible conversation about trade for environment and sustainable development. We have to have I mean, this conversation I mean, on, on water, for example, if you look at the embedded water in fruits, vegetables, produced products, uh, there are several countries in the world that are utterly dependent on liberalized trade for their survival, and they are places where there's already high levels of geopolitical risk. Um, there will be conflict unless those trade flows are maintained. So I think there's a re-engagement to be done with the WTO and uh, I think there's scope to do that, and I'd like to think ODI could play a part in that, and SEI could play a part in that, and IDRI could play a part in that. I think there's also scope, of course, to, to re-engage and invigorate the conversations with all the development bank institutions, but also to have a tough conversation with the central banks and, and uh, the IMF uh, about how they approach their macroeconomic policies uh, with a view to enabling countries to be more resilient in the face of climate change. And Christine Lagarde has been leading this idea for ages. Obviously, she's moved from one institution to another. She's signaling an intent to have a serious conversation about this. But we're living in a world where we've got negative interest rates in some jurisdictions in the world. That's a risk in itself. There's a desperate need to deploy pension money ask Emma, <laughs> uh, and, and to, to produce yields that are better than that and produce something for the long-term beneficiaries. We have to move capital into infrastructure uh, all the way around the world, but that infrastructure has to be resilient infrastructure, and it needs to be in places where people uh, need replacement for what is currently there because that's not good enough. That's a massive 
capital deployment, but it's for a return uh, that is of the type that these pension funds need. The problem, of course, is the policy framework is not adequate for guaranteeing the kind of reward that we need, and it doesn't build in enough of the public goods that we want. But I think that is a place to put effort where a reward would come um, over time. Thank you, James. So just before I turn to Emma, I'll throw in a, one more question from the live stream. This comes from Joe Thwaites, who cites uh, the report published yesterday by the Global Commission on, on Adaptation um, and its point that, uh, that we need to in, uh, increase concessional finance uh, for adaptation. Uh, he notes that the Paris Agreement calls for a balance between uh, finance for mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and is asking uh, whether we should be calling for uh, an adaptation-specific finance goal under the UNFCCC. To add that in there, Emma. I mean, these questions are so big, and the issue that we're dealing with are so complicated that at moments like this one, I'm feeling ever so slightly overwhelmed, <laughs> having tried <laughs> to be optimistic. I kind of go to the things that I know most about and the, the sort of the holding up the mirror and what can you do right now. And one of the videos that I have been showing trustees of pension funds recently is um, a very short video done by school children in the southwest of England. And they are, did an open letter to teachers in Ontario because the teachers, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan owns Bristol Airport and it's the most eloquent, cleverly researched um, bit of questioning. Do you know as teachers where your hard-earned pension savings are investing and given that your pension fund says all of this about environmental social governance and given what we know about climate change and although this is mostly addressed, uh, addressing the low carbon agenda but also air quality, destruction of nature, does it stack up? And when I showed this to a group of chairs of UK pension funds, both public sector and private sector, the reaction was extraordinary. And I go back to what the chief exec of the Chartered Institute of Accounting for England and Wales said, it's, we've laid down an audit trail, the words audit trail of our demise. That becomes the legal challenge of the future. And what that pension fund chair understood was therein lies my potential legal challenge. And so I just give that as one example, because there isn't, you know, we'd all have gone home years ago if we could deal with this simply. There isn't one thing that is going to solve this, but people are getting cleverer in the questions that they are asking, in understanding where savings are flowing, and the responsibility that corporate leaders, pension fund leaders, et cetera, et cetera, have in terms of fiduciary duty and what that really means. And you start beginning to track that down. And you know there, there are so many avenues that we need to pursue in order to shift in the right direction. But again, that's where I start seeing hope. And um, you know, I haven't answered a fraction of the questions that have been asked this afternoon, but we have to look at these clever and new, joining up the dots, using legal frameworks, using what is already in existence, asking very bold and blunt questions, politely but with force, and that's where we will start seeing some of the changes that we need. But this is, as I keep on saying, just huge and needs so much effort, both at a national, a local, national and global scale. But these are the sorts of avenues that are being looked at to really make a fundamental difference. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Emma. There are several people on the live stream are, are, are following exactly the same train of thought. Uh, we have uh, someone called Francis suggesting that, um, that uh, these kinds of fiduciary duties should be written into companies' acts uh, and uh, future companies' acts and so on. I'll we also have, I mean, Graham, in a former role, was on the Committee of Climate Change. Mm. And again, that is another legal so framework that can hold governments to account as being replicated around the world. And you need a combination of all of, the, all of these things because we, it starts adding up to something really significant. But at, to date, is short of what is required. Thank you. I'll turn to Rebecca before we go to closing remarks. 
Um, okay, thanks, James. Yeah, I'll try and um, address uh, some of these questions. Um, perhaps taking the one online about breaking down some of the silos and how to mainstream. I mean, the sort of go-to answer is, you know, it needs to be moved out of just the remit of the Environment Ministry. It needs to be um, integrated more into um, economic and, and planning ministries. But also, I would say, it's also about engaging um, sort of as well more on on the community side with, with for example, faith-based groups. So... Um, the role that, um, say, Islamic financing um, might play, the role that um, different faith-based groups um, might play in, um, pop, um, in, um, in, in communicating more broadly um, about climate change and, and adaptation and integrating that. So it's, it's about diversifying the, the group, not just from the sort of traditional where we need to engage the private sector or we need to um, broaden it out of the environment ministries. Actually, it's about thinking about who are the messengers, who are the ones who can, who can really get that, that message out there. Um, I totally take Graham's point um, on the, the issue of uh, biophysical, yes, not being anywhere near what we answer, ocean systems, cryosphere, um, absolutely, I, I will qualify <laughs> my, my statement going forward, but I, th I think that's an important point. And I think in terms of the institutions, as we said, there are some um, that we do have in, in place, and I think um, a coalition of the willing should should be formed, or the not so willing, um, but it should at least be the, the major UN conventions, WTO, as we've heard about, um, those from the uh, Water Convention and so on, but also other regional bodies or other new organisations that are popping up. Um, we, well, we obviously have Reef Co uh, Mekong River Commission, but there's also the Chinese-led Lansang um, uh, commission that's developed and that brings me to the point that the the sovereignty question actually and slightly the elephant in the room on this is the geopolitical angle of all of this i think engaging countries such as china on these agendas is absolutely critical um, because china has its belt and road initiative and um, this is a major global initiative rolling out a very ambitious, uh, ambitious um, development plans in many countries. Um, and we talk to China a lot about emissions, emissions, but actually China has also a lot of um, experience and expertise on, on adaptation, but is also an upstream com country, is also heavily involved in many regional institutions, has a very large voice to... Um, and has very deep pockets. So I think it's about reframing our approach to the different actors. I was slightly surprised sort of moving back to the UK after living in China for about 16 years, how still we are very focused on um, engaging with the more traditional countries that we feel comfortable engaging with, Europe or, or, or the Americans or whatever. But actually we need to be thinking about engaging on these discussions with um, countries such as China who are going to um, be game changers, both in China, where you're talking about 1.3 billion people, but also what China's doing um, internationally. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. The, in a moment, I'll uh, pass to Mons for our closing remarks, but just before I do that, I'd like uh, to invite you to give a hand to all of our panelists, panelists for that whirlwind tour. So, so many insights, I won't even attempt to, to draw them out. But um, this entire uh, agenda, this lens, this way of looking at adaptation started with a small group of researchers at the Stockholm Environment Institute, so it seems apt that we turn for the last word to the director, the ex executive director of the Stockholm Environment Institute, Mons Nilsson, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, James. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a real pleasure to listen to this afternoon's discussion. Um, I've learned a lot. And uh, as James said, uh, that, uh, this initiative is leveraged on some quite innovative research that's been going on in SEI and uh, in ODI um, and with our partners. And we're really thrilled to be 
joining up uh, in a partnership to take this initiative forward. Um, and I would like to start by inviting all of you to, to join us in our quest to inspire action in this important area. Um, some, just a quick reflection, I think we, we see now that transnational climate impact uh, is something that affects all countries, regardless of level of development. It's underpinning the universality aspect that has been become such an important aspect of the 2030 agenda as well, which hasn't been mentioned today. It also affects all sectors. It affects energy production. It affects water resources management. It affects agriculture, food, uh, industrial uh, machinery, and, and the export market, and the home office, and migration, etc., through the pathways that have been discussed. But it's really no one's job to look after that today. So we need to establish uh, who's going to do this job. Um, they, this will be a different job from the local adaptation and the local risk management. It will re require a different response. It will require new skills and new collaborations. Um, I think it's purely strengthening the case for policy coherence. Uh, but we also see that this will pose challenges and that uh, the politics around adaptation will change when we look at these uh, um, transnational aspects. So some responses might even have negative repercussions on other policy areas, uh, in particular if those responses are not coordinated, such as when uh, countries are banning exports or when uh, supply chains might be disrupted uh, willingly. So it's really strengthening the case for international cooperation and international governance as well. Uh, but thirdly, it's also an opportunity. Uh, I think we see that interests among different actors start to intersect more clearly when we take this transnational lens. Um, it will have an effect on geopolitical relations, of course, but it also ha will have an effect on businesses. And I think it more clearly opens the door for engagement with the private sector and with the financial with the finance community. It has to do with uh, the internal supply chains uh, of companies. It has to do with, as I said, export markets. Uh, it has to do with investors. It has to do with in insurers. So strengthening the case for uh, private sector engagement also in the international climate arena. Um, so for me, Finally, I think it has also clearly demonstrated today that it's strengthening the case for research partnership, as there are many issues to resolve uh, before we can actually take action. And we're looking forward to the coming months and years in, in, in uh, moving this forward. So thank you all. Thanks to everybody. Thanks for, to those joining us on the live stream and to those in the room. Please join us from, for some refreshments outside.